Anyway, so let's go ahead and get started. So I hadn't said it yet, but the uh, topic of this uh, this month's uh, meeting, it's our, uh, we, we decided to do this quarterly, uh, like, I don't know, two years ago. And uh, uh, so this is one of our um, uh, imaging target challenges. And in this case, what uh, we asked everybody to do is to go out and see what you can get as far as a uh, solar system object. And so, uh, all right, let's take a look at the results. So we're gonna go with the people who are here in person and starting in alphabetical order that we have here. Uh, Annabelle, you're up. Okay, this is as far as I'm standing up. So um, both Naveen and Chris said I should add this, so I did. This is just a picture of my uh, mirror and my new to me XT8 that um, some guy in Alabama <laughs> that's that's a, a neighbor of my coworker sent up uh, for me, and uh, it hadn't been used since 2005, so the mirror was in pretty rough shape. Um, but as you can see here, I took a picture of a solar system object, a uh, radio tower here, both before and after I cleaned the mirror. It was definitely worth it, as you can see, and I'm excited to use it more. That's basically it. So who's next? Um, it actually didn't take too long. It took me maybe about an hour. Um, I just put it like on a towel in the sink with some lukewarm water and a little, little bit of uh, dish detergent. And I used the fingertip method. I didn't use cotton. So um, there are some specks here that I was worried um, had eaten into the finish of the mirror. But as you can see, there's only like maybe one or two that actually ate into the finish. So it may have to be resurfaced in the future, but it's, it's way better now than it was. So. Yes, and I know I also wanted to point out, I know that Naveen probably appreciates the one in the top right with all that dust, because he's a big fan of dust. All right, pass it on to the next person, which would be Andrew. You gotta move the mask over here. Um, so I took a couple pictures of the uh, near full moon um, basically with two different setups. So this was um, with the uh, C8 uh, Smith Cassegrain and uh, a DSLR, my uh, Canon 70D. Um, and this I actually did, I forget what mount I had it on, I think. But the, uh, the issue was I didn't have any control over the DSLR directly, and I, I didn't think it was going to work well in a video mode. So this is actually using the um, app on the for the camera to do a bunch of like continuous, um, like as fast as it can. I think they were like one, yeah, something like that. But I was able to do it with, so you could do it remotely start it, and then it would do like, 50 pictures as fast as it could and i actually i ended up stopping it before it finished most of the time because the camera was too slow to actually yeah it would like it would like start stopping like because it would it would be trying to save them all um so, uh this one was i think it was early april um yeah and um for both of them i used um What's it called? Auto Starket, something like that. Starket three. I think what's most people use. <laughs> okay, so then the second picture. Okay, so the first one was the beginning of March. This one was the beginning of April. Um, so this was with an actual Astro camera, a ZWO uh, 385MC. But uh, I set it up with an old uh, vintage uh, 200 millimeter uh, prime lens um, that I've been using for like a year now. And it, it usually gets pretty good results. And for the moon, the fact that it has some chromatic aberration isn't really such a big deal. So, um, this was probably like 20 minutes of, of video versus the other one, which was probably a few hundred individual photos. Um, this was a month later. 
Um, yeah, I think this one didn't come out quite as good. And I think it was actually a little hazy that day. It's probably why. But, you know, once the full moon, there's, especially if it's a little hazy, there's not much else to do. So that's why I did these. Um, so who's ever's next? Roger, Roger Schmidt has a grain there to show us like, uh, I, I guess the equipment. Yeah, so that's something I told everybody to uh, um, bring, just show us your optics that you use to take your images. So um, where is my stuff? Put it down somewhere. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay, well, first off, here's this picture right here. The optics I used for this were a Google Pixel phone. <laughs> so, and uh, so uh, some of you already know, um, I went out west uh, to uh, mostly in uh, Arizona. And of course, one of the places I had to go and see was where a solar system object uh, hit the earth and formed the, uh, the supreme example of a crater uh, 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 um, uh, from a meteor uh, strike. And uh, this was uh, over uh, about an hour east of Flagstaff. And everybody's probably seen it. It's called the Meteor Crater. It's also called the Behringer Crater. Uh, of course, the uh, meteorite has a different name, I guess, because someone named Holsinger found it uh, before everybody else. And uh, this is just a small piece of it in the exhibit area of, uh, of that landmark. So. Uh, I didn't go into a whole lot of detail there. This, this place was awesome. It was, it was really cool seeing all, uh, they had all these factoids about uh, meteorites, like uh, what is a meteorite? Where do they come from? All these other famous uh, meteor uh, right, uh, or meteor strikes around the, uh, around the planet and talked about the extinction of the dinosaurs by, uh, by meteor impact and whatnot. I also talked about the comments like uh, uh, that famous shoemaker Shoemaker Levy 9 comet that slammed into Jupiter back in the early 90s, I believe. But anyway, so that's what one piece of the solar system object looks like, and it was not very much of a challenge to take, you know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, okay, yeah, next picture. So that's, uh, this was, um, uh, j j well, that's, that's the crater right there, obviously. But uh, let's see, I don't know if it's getting cut off or not. Um, okay. Let's see. Ish. Okay, well. Yeah, I thought it was off to the side. Maybe I'm not thinking of the right picture, but but anyway, this is uh, uh, like one of the images I took of the crater. And uh, uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, I guess, or next image. Go to next image. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, so here's a panorama, one of the few uh, that I did, and um, uh, but that gives you a, like sort of a, a scope of uh -huh, such a cool word to use at this meeting, a scope of what this place looks like. And uh, yes, it is uh, about a mile in diameter. Um, can't go around the crater. You're only at orbit down in it. You're only allowed to. There's only like three points where you can set uh, that have been set up where you can go and look out onto the crater. Uh, so anyway, next one. Imp uh, it was 150 feet. Made a one mile. <laughs> made a one mile impact. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, sort of pretty face of mine right there. And yes, uh, uh, right there in the back. You know, don't pay attention to the guy. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, yeah, and some of you may notice I went down to the OK Corral in Tombstone earlier before I went here. Uh, but but anyway, um, yeah, that's just proof that I was there. So yeah, sorry about the front teeth. <laughs> anyway, all right, next one. OK, oh, wait a minute. No, this is the picture I was talking about. I thought that's, yeah, the first one was what was being cut off. Yeah, OK, well, the thing I liked about this picture is uh, if you look, you can see one of the uh, platforms uh, going out 
onto the uh, onto the crater there at uh, I guess center lower uh, right. And yes, those little black specks there, those are people. That gives you an idea of how big the thing is. So that's cool. And I guess last picture. I think that's the last picture. Let's see, yeah, five. Okay. Anyway, um, so some of the pictures you may have seen, you probably could tell that there's some sort of structure going on in the middle and something light or whatever. Well, when they first uh, um, learned about the uh, about the uh, uh, about the meteor and or just, I guess uh, trying to do science around it, somebody came up with the idea of uh, of uh, uh, drilling and going down to find other things that the, that the, uh, uh, that the uh, meteor may have left behind. Uh, one of the other things that they did is, um, uh, or, or what we did is that some of the uh, Apollo astronauts did a quick, a little training session to see what it's like to walk around down inside of a crater. And so that's what you're seeing there, a little guy, a space suit and uh, the American flag right there. Um, yeah, and the American flag is just like set up like that, sort of like on the moon. It's not meant to be blown around, although it was very windy there. And from what I can, uh, from what I've been told, is that it's an area where there's a lot of crosswind activity, and it all comes to around that area. And, um, and uh, there's the closest town, um, Winslow. I don't know if it should be called Windslow or whatever. Uh, they encountered it a lot too. But to get an idea. Um, I was told that the uh, um, the sustained winds while we were there were uh, 30 miles per hour, and we had gusts that were uh, 50 miles per hour. And uh, went and talked to one of the guys there, and he said that yeah, that's typical. And he said that two days, uh, uh, we got two days down the road, they were going to have uh, gusts of up to 75, so hurricane force winds um, at the at the crater. Yay! So, <laughs> and then. Uh, I think that's it. Is that it? Yep, that's it. All right, Mike Keith. Thank you. Um, just a real ch quick check. Are people in the um, Zoom meeting able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. I don't know why I'm I'm not. So okay. Uh, so I wasn't sure what the uh, requirements were. Um, in terms of when you could uh, enter a photo if they had to be done in the last month or so? Yeah, okay, so I seriously cheated here. Uh, no, I actually flew to a different location in, in space. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, was, I was being strong-armed into posting some pictures. So this is a, a view uh, of the Great Conjunction. This was the night after uh, the the... the kind of the, the closest approach. Um, uh, both Doug Lively and I had uh, decided that it would be great to get up above um, some of the trees, considering how low it was. So we went to the uh, library in Cary, went to their parking lot up there. Well, apparently hundreds of other people had the same idea and uh, everything we were trying to do, it was just shaking like crazy. So this was the next day, but and it's just a, a video, I think it's about five minutes of video. Each one was set uh, so I could get a good exposure of Jupiter and its belts. Uh, and then the other one was set so I could bring in some of Jupiter's moons and Saturn. So that was that one. That was 2020. Yeah, that one's not coming out so good. I don't know why. Uh, it looks a little grainy but uh so this is my very first um h alpha shot and it was just done with eyepiece projection um and i think an iphone five or six at the time so um not even that it was this was handheld so um and not even tracking so it was it was a comedy of of errors to even get to this point but it can be done um all right we'll jump to the next one uh, so this one, uh, again, a while ago, but I believe, I don't know if someone actually took a uh, picture, someone posted about the, the recent transit, I don't know if it was a solar or lunar transit, um, but this is a, a lunar transit from some time ago, and you, if you kind of uh, watch, it's just a gif going over and over, but you can kind of see the uh, um, 
space station going across. And when it actually, when I actually took it, I w- there was no way. I, n- I never saw it once. I just knew the timing. Um, so I basically had three minutes before and three minutes after and then, you know, found this. So um, it was just like, yeah, there was no possible way you could visually see it. It was so fast. All right, we'll jump. And this one, so that other one was taken with a, um, um, it was just my uh, refractor um, uh, doublet. Um, and uh, I think at the time it was in uh, ZWO 385. Uh, this one was actually taken with an iPhone, just holding it and uh, was using the software package uh, Nightcap. Uh, so that turned out, I thought, you know, pretty darn good for just you know, zooming in on an iPhone. Well, this one's also a while. This is at least three or four years old, <laughs> if not more. Uh, all right, we'll jump to the next one. And I think this is the last one, but, uh, and again, <laughs> quite dated. Uh, but this was for the uh, Venus transit back in 2012. Um, and this was just a cheap, you know, uh, basically, uh, what do you call it, department store refractor. Uh, and I made a sun, a sun funnel. Um, and it's, it's hard to see, but you can actually, I wonder if you can zoom in. Um, Use the plus button there. Yeah, uh, I don't know if it'll come out in the in on on there, but uh, you can actually in in the the actually the photo on my laptop, you can actually make out where Venus is. It's it's a black dot, and it's right. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, so, but yeah so it was but it, i had to say um, it was a great event that we did uh, way back when and um you know this made it kind of really accessible people can see oh i can use just about anything uh to catch a transit so i think that's it that's obviously what yeah um no those skinny legs belong to my daughter <laughs> I'll just do it here. All right, so this, uh, I cheated a little bit. Um, this is a three panel mosaic of um, Pleiades through Barnard seven. And in late December, I took this, like I think just after Christmas, um, I've gone back and gotten the, the left panel was my third panel because that's Mars photobombing it. I had no idea it was gonna be in the frame and two minute exposures at F2 is a lot for Mars. Um, there were like tertiary ref- uh, reflections and all sorts of stuff I, I cleaned up. And once I realized what it was, I, like, I didn't try to finish processing the picture, but um, yep. I now pay attention a little bit to where the planets are <laughs> because it matters apparently, especially wide field. I mean, it took three months for Mars to move out. So um, I have, yeah, yeah. I think it was, I don't know which way it was going, but it was, it was problematic for a while. Plus clouds and whatnot, I guess, got in the way as well. Um, so this, of course, is the green comet. I, it's about 2.3 hours taken on the 23rd of January uh, from my backyard. Um, It was moving pretty fast at the time, so about a third of the frame, if you looked at the raw uh, stacked images, comet aligned, about the bottom third of the frame is mess from all the the stacking artifacts, but um, managed to keep it. So so this is, I I picked a spot where it would be, you know, pretty well centered and have the nice tail on the, the ion tail, the dust tail, and what is that there's a tail coming off the front i can't remember anti-tail yes thank you that was i oh so i've got like six more comet data sets to process and i haven't touched them yet i'm done um so somebody in the club i can't remember who mentioned um getting a image of series i think that was mark Playing. So I was like, okay, fine, I'll 
give it a shot. And so I went wide field and you see a whole bunch of com, um, galaxies and whatnot. Um, but there's also an asteroid I caught, um, Chloris. So in Pixinsight, Insight, if you look at the rejection frames, you'll see a streak sometimes, and that's going to indicate there's something there. So um, hopefully this will show it. Yep. Wow. Can't really see it. But um, the one on the right is the dwarf planet, and the one on the left, that is the asteroid. And this 135 millimeter camera lens. So um, I didn't expect to see much, but a little dot. And then all right, let's see how this goes. So this should be series. So you can see it's moving. And this is just no special processing, just went with um, blink and. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just uh, did a preview on that one. And then for Chloris again, just to see what I got. Uh, there it is, kind of in the middle. Just slowly moving along. So that was fun. I got to learn about FFmpeg and processing videos and fix insight. Um, this was with my. Yeah. Can I ask a quick question? On that last one. What was the time duration of the frames? How long? How long of a time difference did they represent? Yeah, let me go back to the stack because I have that. It was five and a half hours. So the so the two, I mean, those are really cool videos. So those two shots is is five and a half hours of uh, yeah. time difference to go to show that. Yep, that's there. From very cool. All the raw images I didn't. Oops, that I didn't uh, reject, which I don't think I probably would have rejected much. I, uh, there's some faint something there. I don't know. No. I, I, I have been getting some data from uh, Whirlpool Galaxy with the same setup, so really wide field, just to see what's there. Five hours, I see something similar. Um, I think I have 10 hours now. I haven't processed, but... I'm gonna see what I get. Um, I don't think it's the camera, but it could be. It's a DSLR. This is the Canon T2i. So no, I'm I'm having a blast with it. What are you talking about? I love this kind of stuff. That and it's not, you know, I don't mind putting it out in the pollen. <laughs> um, okay, onward. So Pixel Seven, um, sitting on my front porch, eating lunch one day and looked up and there's this cool round rainbow thingy. So I took this, um, I did clean it up a little bit to reduce, there was, you know, faint clouds and saturated a little bit. This is pretty much what it was like. That's the sun. Yeah, I'd never seen it either. And I was like, it was really cool. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I looked it up. I remember it was, it's called a glory, I think, but I don't remember what it's caused by. But I don't care what it was caused by. It looks really cool. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not looking at it through a camera or anything. Uh, so this was, when was this? I can't remember when this was. This was Mar, uh, sorry, Moon and Jupiter, and we had clouds, and I just went for it, and you can see still, you know, little pinpricks of light along Jupiter over here for some of its moons. So I think it turned out kind of neat. I want to say this was with the one thirty-five millimeter as well, just on a tripod, and ah. This one's for you, Dana. Uh, 
lunar x right right there so happens once a month for four and a half hours i mean it, it starts to form and then it's solid for about four and a half hours it's the the edges of two craters that are next to each other being lit uh, without the rest of the crater and then down here should be yep there's lunar v so kind of upside down and at an angle similar similar uh, structure and how it's formed but um five minutes after i got the this was with a two minute video uh, five minutes afterwards it clouded up so <laughs> i got lucky quite lucky i wanted to do like a time lapse so i was taking videos as it was forming and then i was like maybe the clouds will behave and they didn't All right, and I think that's it. Chris, you want to close? Yeah. All right, yep, that's all there is here in the share. <laughs> Chris? All right, thanks, guys. Um, Okay, so now we move on to our friends uh, who are meeting us virtually. Who would like to go? Anybody there? <laughs> I would like to present some images of uh, the Imaging Target Challenge Solar System Object. I, I can show you something, Chris. Okay, go for it. Right. Let's see if the sharing works here. Uh, I don't see sharing. I'm wrong. Oh, yeah, there. Sorry. Never mind. No, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So we need to turn that on. There we go. Is that clear? Yep, we got it. All right. Uh, I'm cheating too because these are a while back. I've been out of the country for a month, so I didn't have any time to do anything new. Uh, this is uh, one of my solar videos. Uh, it's probably about three hours uh, using my LUT60 on a solar tracking mount, which I'll show in a minute, and then captured with fire capture. Uh, I don't know exactly how many frames, but quite a lot for probably one a minute for three hours. So it's a lot. There's a lot. So I put the process them all in auto stacker and, and various other things and put together in, in a video. So it's repeating itself. I just set, set the thing on my deck and just aimed it at the sun and let it go into the laptop and and uh, was able to get something that I thought was relatively nice. Uh, I have, I've been wanting to try this again recently, but I, I just haven't been around enough to do that. So uh, the next one is a picture of the of the solar system that I used. The one sixty H job and I added a. a pressure tuner and a LUT focuser onto it at some point a couple of years ago. And then a, a, a focuser, and then the Orion Solar uh, Star Seeker tracking mount, which is a very nice way to do uh, solar things, uh, whether it's just solar things or with, uh, uh, if you want to do an animation or something like that. And then a ZWO174MM mono camera. And I it, it found out that at least in the summertime, this thing gets terribly hot in the sun. So I got a, I got a uh, cooler that, that magnetically clicks on the back of this and uh, runs on a USB battery and it works very nicely to keep the camera cool. Because I found that when, it, when this camera uh, gets too hot, it just stops. It doesn't do anything. So I, I need to put a cooler on it. So this is basically the setup I use for all the things I do that are solar. Uh, it's, it's a very nice thing to mount. You just press a button and it finds the sun. Then you do some minor adjustments to get it centered and then you just let it go. And it pretty much tracks for a long time. Uh, so I've been quite happy with it. I wouldn't use anything heavier than this LED 60 on it probably because it would be a little problematic, but, but it works pretty nice uh, for this kind of thing. Uh, then this is an old hey, uh, question. Steve. Yeah, Steve, uh, uh, a little off topic, but uh, that cooler that you used for your 174, um, 
so Mike Bantini pointed out some um, that uh, like a uh, type of cooler that you could hook up to, uh, but for you specifically, um, could you like send a message out to the group and, you know, link it to uh, what you're using? Uh, it's exactly the same thing that Mike recommended. Do what? Uh, Michael's recommendation was what I used to buy it. Okay. All right. Good. Well, he he mentioned that it was like a cell phone cooler and I was, and I went online and I was like, well, there's lots of them and all right, I'll see if I didn't mean to get one. So it's just like, I wonder what, what you, what you're using. Uh, yeah. I'll, uh, uh, it actually has a little magnetic pad that fits on the back of this and it clicks onto that and you power it with, with a USB battery. I'll find it and put it up somewhere. All right. Thanks, Steve. Works nicely. Uh, for hold on one second. Yeah. Hey, Steve, it's Mike Keefe. Um, yeah. In the, the, the view or, or the shot before your, your video of the solar uh, with the yeah. solar prominence. Um, just out of curiosity, what was your imaging train? Um, I mean, are you using a Barlow to capture that or? Uh, no, in fact, there's no Barlow. It, it was just slot 60. So there's no, there's no Barlow on it or anything. Okay. And, but, but you can sort of zoom in and just get that part of the, get a part of the sun. Uh, with the, just just in the in the fire capture software okay so you're like doing the region of interest or something exactly exactly okay all right thank you and then this this one is one of my moon pictures this is a 16 frame mosaic that i did this would be my uh, uh edge hd8 uh again with the 174 camera and i just i just aimed it at the sky and just Took a bunch of movies of the whole thing, moving all across to make sure I got everything in. Then I processed them all uh, in Auto Stacker and, and uh, various Photoshop and various other things. And then I used uh, the Microsoft ICE program to do the mosaic to piece them all together. And it works pretty well. Uh, and the, of course, the advantage of that is you get, uh, again, this was done years ago, and I, I think I'm probably better at processing now, but I haven't reprocessed really it yet. And you can then zoom in on these things and still see stuff that you, you really can't. You just take a single, a single image of the full, full moon. So th it was kind of fun. It took all, it took many hours to do it, uh, but uh, and I may try to do something like that again. If you zoom in too much, you can kind of lose it on the screen. But uh, that's a fun way to do the moon uh, with with that kind of thing. And this is a comment. I guess I did this at Big Woods back in 2014. Uh, this was with my Stellar View 102 and probably my ZWO 071, but it might have been with my Canon camera. I can't, I don't have the data on that anymore. So this is one of many comments that this is probably the best one I've got from showing these these tails that are coming off the comet. Um, but that was a long time ago. I could probably reprocess this one again now too with better software and whatnot. Okay, Chris, that's all I've got. All right, superb, as usual. Let's see, okay, uh, who'd like to go next? In our virtual group over there. <coughs> Bless you. Um, anybody else have any uh, images they would like to uh, share? Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, Marshall, yeah. Yeah, I have a single image I'll just share real quick. It's not anything special, but just so I could say that I shared something, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's that's perfectly fine. Go for it. All right, one second. Oh, cool. So wants to share my other monitor. Sorry, one second. <laughs> All right. Can we see that okay? Uh, not yet. Oh. There we go. Got it. All right. So uh, we happen to get uh, a little bit of good seeing, if you can call it that, a couple weeks ago. And I, uh, Venus was just above the trees uh, by my house. So uh, I shot this little clip of Venus. I literally only got about, I want to say it was like two minutes before it went down behind the trees. 
So, um, but this is my first actual attempt at Venus, I'd say. Uh, shot with a C9 and a quarter. Uh, I think I had a, a 1.5 Barlow in. Probably still oversampled just a little bit, just because, again, seeing was not like anything spectacular, and it's still pretty low. But uh, I decided to run the data anyway just to see what I got. And, yeah, this is what I got. It's a little fuzzy, as you can tell. Like I said, probably mostly due to seeing, I guess. But it may be out of focus a little bit. I'm not exactly sure. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I ran it through uh, Auto Stackard and did a little bit of sharpening or Reggie stacks and I'm at least happy with the color. Um, <laughs> can't see much cloud details. Of course, I don't have any special filters or anything, which I think, uh, some of the more experienced planetary people are doing for Venus at least, but, um, yeah. Well, I can set you in the right direction if you want. Um, that would be great. Uh, you probably seen that there's UV filters that yeah, I was using, a well, this is the shot with a 178 MC, which has the built-in um, UV infrared cut filter. But yeah, I'm, I did read about a little bit of there's like an additional UV uh, filters or whatever. But yeah, if you got any tips on that or anything, I'm all, I'm all ears. Well, you this is a color camera, so um, I don't know if it'll help at all. Yeah, <laughs> so, great. <laughs> but, and then also it, it's, it's pretty difficult with a, a Schmidt as well, because UV, um, as far as optics goes, uh, UV likes to, uh, uh, gets to a camera sensor easier if it's re being reflected and not refracted. So unfortunately with a Schmidt, you got that corrector plate in the way and, uh, the, uh, um, UV photons, any, any, uh, high frequency photons, they'll just, uh, tend to uh, bounce off glass um pretty easily but oh so, yeah you're missing some of the uh i see yeah so that that's one thing that kills you um but i have used a schmidt cassegrain in fact it was a c9 and a quarter i have i've got a c11 now i haven't tried it with that yet but uh um the other thing you'll need of course is a uh, monocam but the cheapest way to like make a, a make a uv filter is that some people uh, who do visual, um, there's a type of filter that's deep purple. It's called Rattan 47. And uh, that will uh, cut off a lot of uh, just about anything that's uh, dark purple or uh, longer. When I mean longer, as in longer wavelength um, than right. uh, purple. But the, uh, the other thing, too, is that you will need a stack onto that filter a uh, an IR uh, rejection filter because for some reason that ratten it still allows uh, that ratten filter which is only supposed to allow dark purple uh, and uh, lower uh, or a uh, higher frequency wavelengths to come through it still allows IR to go through so if you get those two and a monocam yeah gotta get the monocam too <laughs> yeah you, you, you'll probably you can't you can't get lucky I, i've i've gotten clouds before um on venus uh that was the only way to do it the uh the best way to do it uh and um yeah i'm looking at naveen right now is uh, to use a newtonian oh, <laughs> that same setup so yeah 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 yeah, yeah i don't have um i have a, a dobsonian that might actually work for it but uh I didn't even, I didn't know that about the, uh, sensor, you can just let it so. you know, roll by. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've done that before with some of my other planetary images and a lot of those turned out better than the, than with the C9 and a quarter. So, <laughs> so you yeah, got Venus showing up a little yellow there, right? So, uh, um, yeah. that's, about, that's about what mine looked like if I were to do it in color. Yeah. As well. Comparing with what, what other people have shared on, you know, cloudy nights and stuff. It's, uh, like I said, it's about the right color. Again, without, I think with the seeing, there's virtually no way you'll get any like cloud details or whatever, but um, let alone, you know, nice sharp edges or <laughs> anything like that. But what kind of mount was it? What's that? What kind of mount was it? Uh, it's on a Gem 45. Okay. All right. Equatorial. So, yeah. It's, it's pretty steady. Like I said, it may, it may be missing a little bit of focus too, but I had literally two minutes to try. <laughs> <laughs> so but okay all right very good That's thanks thanks okay anybody else want to go
I've got a few, Chris. All right, go for it, Johnny. Most disabled screen share. Okay. Uh, hmm. Okay, you see that? Yes, we do. Looks good. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> I was up in the middle of the night the other night watching the eclipse on the other side of the world on webcast, which, uh, you know, is kind of a letdown compared to seeing it in person. But I noticed these prominences. And uh, next morning I got up and I went to the uh, National Solar Observatory website and, and looked at the images there and they were still there. So I configured uh, you know, a refractor with my quark to, uh, to do this image. This is about, about 200 frames of uh, 1000 frame clip with a uh, 115 millimeter refractor. And I stopped it down to about 80 millimeters to get it closer to F30 that the quark likes. Um, and uh, uh, this is with a, you know, the F7 scope and the uh, 2X uh, power mate. And uh, it was with the same camera that Steve shot his solar stuff with, the 174mm. And uh, the colors added in, in uh, Photoshop. Yeah, those uh, two spots that are down there, they've been there for quite a while, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I looked at them probably about 10 days ago uh, while I was out west, and yeah, they've, they've been there for quite a while, still going strong, I guess. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. All right, can you see the moon now? Okay. Hey, there's something that's not supposed to be on it, though. Yeah, yeah. This is a uh, this is on April second. Uh, ISS transit <clears throat> um, that crossed uh, uh, Fuquay and uh, uh, Benson, and then on to North Topsail Beach. And uh, Benson was closest to me, so uh, a friend of mine and I met there at a at a middle school in Benson, and. Uh, this is with that same 115 millimeter uh, refractor and my Nikon D850 camera shooting 4K video. And this is uh, about 26 uh, frames of that video stacked um, of, the, of the transit. Is this a black and white camera? Uh, no, it was, a, it was a Nikon D850. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that correctly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, with 4K video. Have you see any color like on the, on the panels? Uh, not much. Uh, got a little, uh, this is a, just another view of one of those frames. Yeah, that's pretty. Blown up. Um, it's better than my it, first time. <laughs> that's the first uh, lunar transit that I had done. Uh, I, I did a solar transit last June. But this one was a pretty good one. The, the ISS was about an arc minute across. It was kind of like uh, uh, the solar one that uh, that Joe Pettit did, what, what yesterday, I think. Uh, uh, that's pretty neat. Uh, I, I prefer the lunar ones because you can see it coming, you know? Uh, yeah, exactly. And well, and if any color shows up on the station, you can actually see it. That's right. That's better right. than just a silhouette on the sun. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I guess this is the same night that Naveen uh, shot this, right? With the crescent moon and, and Jupiter, except I had this cool uh, aircraft contrail drift by. Uh, so uh, that was done from, from my house. And this is, uh, well, this is a, a solar halo right here. I don't know if that was the same. This was on the 24th. When, when was yours, Naveen? Uh, this was, uh, yeah, just a few days ago. 
and a nice uh, solar halo and two sun dogs on either side of it. This is late afternoon. <clears throat> um, and this is uh, Venus uh, in conjunction with the Pleiades on, uh, on April 10th um, with a uh, my Nikon D850 and a uh, 200 to 500 uh, Nikon zoom lens at about 400 millimeter. This is uh, this is like uh, 20 uh, 10 second exposure stacked. What day was that? That was April 10th. Yeah. And that's it. All right, very good. Nice space station shots. Okay, anybody else out there? Um, have any uh, images to share with us? Uh, the imaging target challenge, solar, solar system object. Uh, uh, Chris, I put the, the link in on Amazon's that cooler that uh, Mike asked about. Oh, okay, very good, thanks so much. Okay, is that it? Okay. Um, all right. So, well, uh, that's a wrap for that part of the meeting. Now we move on to the second half, which is all the images we have taken um, since the last meeting uh, that, well, in this case, as far as the imaging target challenge, that are not related to the imaging target challenge. So, no solar system objects, guys. We're done with those. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, uh, so we'll go with uh, the in-person uh, group here, and uh, who, who goes first here? Oh, we're working on it? Okay. Okay, all right, well, we'll go with virtual first. Okay, anybody else, uh, anybody out there have some images they would like to share <laughs> to the target challenge? Um, in the virtual group, I have, I have some that, are, like you said, non-solar systems. I just wanted to get some feedback on. Oh yeah, sure. Show it to us. I so I'm I'm just starting. I um, so I'm using a. I just got a Edge Eleven. So this is over the last month. I've taken some Galaxy photos where I'm using my uh, Canon DSLR and. Um, and uh, doing uh, stacking on the free software that comes with the ASI Air Plus, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, I wanna share a specific. <clears throat> That's better than my first try. So yeah, so I've got lots of frustration. I guess I just wanted to share like huge frustrations in trying to do this at the beginning, like lots of problems in being able to um, make the ASI Air work with the mount and uh, and properly track. And then uh, you know I'm using a, uh, a small scope I already had with a small camera for a guiding scope. So the, this is, so these are a series I took. I'm most of them I'm doing like 23 minute exposures over an hour. And then um, I end up throwing probably five to 10 away usually because they're smearing or the tracking doesn't work quite right. And then um, I did use, I did uh, bias frames and dark frames to try it out, but I have not done any kind of flats. And then I'm, as I said, I'm using a very basic stacking software to put it together, so. And then a couple things. I don't know if you can see this on here that that I get. I mean, I'm happy with the colors and everything like this. I mean, they they came out pretty impressive, so I'm pretty pleased with this, especially since it, you know it's only been like the first couple months I've been doing it. But with my camera, like I don't know if you can see how it's kind of bright in the middle here. Yeah, that's called uh, vignetting, where light falls off of uh, the sensor as you go further away from the center. 
yeah, so I, I have a challenge trying to filter that out and not lose any of the details, the fine details of the subject that I'm trying to do. Okay. And then well, I don't know, there's little specs or defects in here and they, they may not be visible on your screen or anything. Do you see where I'm pointing or? Yeah, hold on, I'm looking. I'm looking at a projector screen. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I could tell that you have some, uh, I guess what I would term as uh, color modeling there. Yeah, uh, yeah. As in, I can see patches of color that are actually, well, supposed to be part of outer space, but it's not, and they're just color patches. Yeah. Uh, those specs you may be talking about, I can't see them that well. Um, I'm wondering if I'm getting like, uh, <clears throat> I, I'm looking at the sensor in the camera and I've been blowing it dry, you know, with air to try and make sure it's clean. But they show up when I do the, when I get the long exposures, like over a minute or so, you start to see. And, and they'll move around. So I'm, I definitely think I'm getting some kind of contamination in there. I just don't know what, so. Well, um, if, you, if, you're, if you're talking about cleaning your camera, it's probably not, it, it probably has nothing to do with your sensor uh, having anything on it. What it most likely is, is it's just camera noise is all it is. And uh, oh, okay. that's one of the downsides, unfortunately, of DSLRs is that all the other cameras are especially specifically made for uh, astrophotography. Mm -hmm. uh, they have coolers. They have uh, have uh, sensors that were designed specifically for not specifically, but are uh, better uh, adapted for taking long exposures. Whereas uh, 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 DSLRs, yes, they may be like you know your typical like SLR film camera back in the day, where you can just take a long exposure and not worry about anything. You're mm -hmm. going to have things like that show up. So um, I don't know. Are you familiar with uh, dark frames? Um, I mean, I'm taking, so what I, so like, let's say with, with these, the stacking I'm, program I'm using, I do, you know, 10 to 20 light frames, which is the exposure. And then uh, I took, um, I've got about five dark frames, which are three minute exposures with the cover on the telescope at the, you know, outside at temperature that I, that I incorporate into it. And then I do a whole series of, you know, short exposure bias frames, which again, just have the cover on the scope, but are just really quick, like 20 of those. But is that what you mean? Like using those to try and calibrate it? Dark, your darks are supposed to get rid of those specs. Uh, it doesn't always happen with my uh, DSLR. They, they uh -huh. still linger behind, although I don't really use my DSLR for uh, uh, like hooking up to a Schmidt category like you have anymore. Yeah. Uh, the the other thing too um you mentioned uh, darks and biases now the light fall off there the vignetting where you know it's bright in the middle but dark as you get further from the center yeah um uh, that can be fixed with flats so okay all right those, that, yeah that's something that uh you need to look into to get get rid of that um i know a procedure in photoshop where you can sort of do get rid of that mm -hmm. uh, but um, it doesn't work very well for nebulae because what it does in Photoshop, it gets rid of uh, nice uniform gradients. Well, a nebula is a whole bunch of gradients. Yeah, yeah. It's a cloud, right? But uh, it could work with this one because I did take an image with a Schmidt Cassegrain grain and a DSLR of the Whirlpool Galaxy a long time ago, but I cannot yeah. remember if... Uh, I put in what I term an artificial flat to uh, get rid of what you're talking about there. So, but um, yeah, just study up on how to do flats. And I mean, you can always send a, put a, a message on discord or through groups IO and, you know, we can start a discussion about it or point yeah. to the direction or whatever. And, and I also like, I've been, you know, since it's just trying, you know, I'm just trying to get the hang of it and the practice of doing the whole process. So I haven't taken, much more data than about an hour on any of these. And usually something's happening. Like I tried like a two hours of data on one galaxy and then half of it I had to throw away because um, I don't have a dew zapper yet. So the whole lens fogged up on me, you know, that night. So most of these, I'll, I'll go through a couple others. I don't know if that switches all right. This was um, this was a try at the nebula. This is something else I found out with a DSLR. Like, uh, like this nebula is obviously very easy to do because it's so bright. But like uh, I tried the Horsehead Nebula and I can't even get it to come out on my camera. And I'm assuming that's because it's very red and the DSLRs are not sensitive to red for this type of photography. At least that's what I've read. Is that is that the case or? 
Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the other thing that may be going on that may be going on is that uh, it could probably pick up more red. Uh, but uh, when a manufacturer uh, wants to uh, adapt a uh, a camera sensor for um, color photography, uh, what they're supposed to do is they should pick out a sensor that's not very sensitive in uh, in long wavelengths or short wavelengths like uh, infrared and uh, and uh, UV. And if it is, what they'll do is they'll put a cover slip over it that uh, rejects IR and uh, UV. Well, the red part that you're talking about, that wavelength, I'm sure you've heard of it, it's called uh, hydrogen alpha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just, the way I say it to everybody, just without like, going into too much detail, is the light of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. I describe it. I mean, because that's what uh, most uh, emission nebula are made of, are made of hydrogen. And uh, that, that's what gives off that red glow. And because you have that cover slip there, it not only just covers up the IR, it also covers up that red wavelength that you would see in, like, like you're saying, the uh, Horsehead Nebula. Okay. Uh, I would imagine, though, if you did the Horsehead, did you try the Horsehead Nebula, though? I tried, um, yeah, I tried to do... I'm not sure how much data I did on it. I mean, I think I did a full, the normal runs I've been doing since again, I'm just starting out. I'm just, I do like the, the 23s, 20, 23 minute exposure. So about an hour. Okay. And um, I did that one. And even after I stacked it, I couldn't even see anything there on that yeah. one. And I'm pretty sure I was looking at the star pattern. I definitely was aiming right at it. So the galaxies are 10, I mean, that, that since I, Doing this with the focal length of this telescope, the galaxies seem like the ideal target right now because they they fit in the um, they fit in the frame pretty well. That was, and so I wanted to you know really as starting out, I want to spend a lot of time working with just the DSLR since I already had it before I invest in a you know a a, a dedicated astrophotography camera because I want to make sure I I know enough about what I really want before I start spending money on it. So, but, um, but it's been fun to do these. Some of these have been pretty happy with how they've been coming out. Yeah, it's nice M81. Yeah. So that, that one, uh, this part here, again, I wasn't sure, like, as I, as I was adjusting it, this is the other question. So I'm using the standard software that comes with it because it's free. I haven't tried out. I know I can do like a trial on Pix Insight. Is it is that pretty much you know a much better program at doing this kind of processing than than these basic ones I've been been using? Yeah. Pix Insight will pretty much uh, well <laughs> it'll wipe the floor with it. So, yeah, yeah. I thought that I would collect more data and then try and do the trial for that to see you know how it works. But yeah, probably that's another investment coming up. Um, um a couple others that. Hey, hold on, Naveen has something to add oh yeah uh, cyril is another good one for the processing side of things um if you don't want to cereal yeah s-i-r-i-l it's got um a gradient a gradient extraction tool which is pretty good it's got photometric color calibration which is nice for getting your colors to where they should be um and a couple other things um i wouldn't start with it for stacking mm -hmm. uh, you want to branch out there uh, deep sky stacker is probably where i would start uh, it's much more intuitive to use and it does multi-night um, integrations much easier than cyril but those are two i would i would recommend taking a look at i think uh, I, I've, yeah. I've used cyril for a couple things and while it can't get as good as pix insight and there's some some clunkiness to it um, i think part of it is just what I'm used to is it's Pix Insight. It doesn't it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Cyril and Deep Sky Stacker is the other one you said. And I was just gonna run through some of these other ones I did. I think uh, let's see. Yeah, this is the one I I think is the the one I I'm happiest with that came out the best was the Pinwheel Galaxy. So that's 100 or not 100 101, right? Uh, 101, yes. Yeah. So this one, I think I got a full 20. I was able to use all 20 exposures on it. 
Um, so that the tracking worked out better for that. And one thing I think as I go further is I'll go back to some of these and maybe collect some more data and then start to see if that helps improve in it. But, but that, like I said, I wanted to, you know, first to go practice through the process of collecting the data, everything, and then see if I can do different processing for it. And that's uh, M106. So another thing I'm noticing in your pictures here, and mm -hmm. it may be just the way it's coming across on our end, because, well, I can't really see, can't really see your, um, uh, you know, your computer screen. <laughs> uh -huh. So uh, the way it looks to me, I'm looking at the corners of all these images that you're showing us of these galaxies, mm -hmm. like they're just a, a flat black color. Yeah, Which so I think, so my, so the, the sensor, it's a full frame camera, it's a Canon 6D. Yeah. So the sensor is 43 millimeters diagonally. And I think that the field of view at the prime focus for uh, an edge 11 is 42. So I, I think what's actually happening is I'm getting the entire field of view is inside the frame of the camera. Okay. And yeah, in some so cases, even after stacking, it's still gonna be that, that dark. Basically, I've, I've got the whole, a lot of these I haven't cropped them at all. So, so you probably, that's, that's what you're gonna see. Okay. Uh, well, the thing I was going to add is, <laughs> sorry, uh, what, uh, so yeah, you're saying your corners are most likely just completely blocked, but, uh, I mean, but, uh, what I'm, what I'm noticing here is that, uh, it's very flat black throughout as far as the blackness of space is the way I would call it. Mm -hmm. Um, what I would do though, is I, whenever I'm processing my images, I never make somewhere that um, that's supposed to be just, you know, an empty area of uh, space. I'd never make it completely black. I always make it a little um, of a, on the dark gray side. Okay. Uh, what that does is that it ensures me that any subtle tones of any of the deep sky object that I'm taking an image of have not been clipped. I don't know if you've ever heard that term clipping the hist histogram. I'm I think I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. And you're, I think you're absolutely right. Cause I, I have been, I think my, my preference has been, I, you know, I wanted that very dark background, but I, I, what basically is I'm sliding, you know, contrast and brightness back and forth and trying to adjust it in order to try and eliminate what looks like a background glow. I'm definitely losing detail on the, on the subject. So yeah, yeah I think you're right think on that. Just a little bit on the gray side, and then yeah, then you should be fine because yeah, it's like I said, if you go to do it too much to make the uh, the background black, what you're doing is you're taking your black point of the image, which would uh, in most programs it would be oriented on the uh, uh, on the left side of the histogram, and mm -hmm. then whatever parts of the histogram um, that are uh, on the left side, um, if you go over those with the black point, set the black point um, um, to the right of, uh, of that signal. Yeah, uh, all that all that tone, it gets lost. It's gone. That's okay. by clipping. So that, That's a good point. I, I definitely see what you're saying there. So that's that's very helpful. I think I got one. I don't know if you want to see. This is the rig. Beautiful. So I don't know if this, this is like I already had this telescope. I just bought a little camera on it is the guide camera that I mounted on top there. That's probably kind of bigger than it needs to be, but the focal length is like 1200 for this. So it's, it's closer to the focal length of the whole scope. For, so what kind of mount is that? It's is that this. CGX? Yeah, it's a CGX. It's the one that comes with, uh, came as a package deal. So. All right. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, you're on the right track. I mean, yeah. So I guess, so. Uh, yeah, your next step would probably be just go ahead and get uh, um, a good process or get familiar with uh, Pix Insight. Um, I'm still getting familiar with it myself uh, because I don't, uh -huh. I cannot wean myself uh, onto it. I mean, because I just, I'm just such a Photoshop guy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Pix Insight going from photo, or at least for me, it's been excruciating. I mean, it's just a completely different animal. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but but Devine makes a good point. It's like you, Cyril. I guess. Am I in the consensus here with you? Uh, use serial to process, whereas use Deep Sky Stacker to stack. Yeah. 
So, yeah, so, yeah, but yeah, there you go. So you have two free programs to you get yourself started or you can do what you said and uh, do the free trial of Pix Insight. Uh, although, had it been, if I were in your shoes, um, I probably would be very frustrated with Pix Insight because I know I probably wouldn't learn as much as I should in mm -hmm. the trial period that they give you. But, uh, yeah, it's a monster yeah. of a program, but it's very useful. I mean, um, there's processes that I do use uh, Pix Insight for. Well, I do actually, it's kind of, it's funny the way you're saying it. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm uh, um, going off on tangent here, but uh, yeah, um, uh, I guess you, you you could say that Pix Insight is my deep sky stacker. <laughs> and then, and then, and then uh, Photoshop is my serial is the way it is. Cause I don't know, yeah, I just have an easier time processing images after registering and aligning. Mm -hmm. From multiple nights and all that in uh, Photoshop better than I do in in Pix Insight, but yeah, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm slowly getting away from uh, Photoshop. Maybe three one years down the road, I'll be done with Photoshop. Yeah, one one thing, I, and I found this I, some the software I'm using is the one that comes with uh, ASI Air, right? And uh, so that does a pretty good job of stacking. But then if I I have Photoshop and Lightroom, right? But the problem is that the the output from the ASI Air software is a JPEG, and I can't. Oh my God! You know, so so the you put that into Photoshop, it's not going to work. You need the raw image, and I can't. I haven't figured out. There's probably a way to do it, and I just don't know yet. But I haven't figured out how to take the raw stacked image. Like when I try and just look at it, it's like a fit file, and uh Lightroom will not recognize that as a picture file. It won't look at it. So maybe I'll search around. There may be some way to do that, but that that way I could do some of that processing. Because the the ASI uh software is very simple. It does it doesn't really have a lot of there's basically like two things I can slide back and forth to adjust it and that's about it as far as adjusting it once you stack it. So um well thanks for the feedback and also the the suggestions there i i appreciate it. that was really helpful so thanks for the help if you have a fits file Levine, if you have the fits file um cyril can load it and then you can save it as different formats like tiff okay or what photoshop and lightroom can handle but pretty much anything else probably you and those software like cyril and the deep sky stacker are those like open software or are they yeah, they're they're both free. Um, okay. And I, my recommendation would be start with them because you'll learn uh -huh. a lot about processing before you do the Pix Insight trial if that's what you want to do. Because I okay. think I I dove in and tried Pix Insight earlier than I should have, and it took me a couple months after my trial before I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I should have gone and tried that a little. <laughs> bit. But um, yeah, I ended up of course buying it, but. Yeah, I, I would wait a bit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's really good advice. And unlike uh, Photoshop, Pix Insight is just a one-time buy. You don't have to do a subscription like you have to do um, Adobe these days. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, I already had the subscription for Adobe just because I I do other photography too. So, but um, but yeah, that's a good point. Okay, that's been a good discussion. Uh, anybody else uh, have anything they want to show? No. Okay. Yeah, I do. I do uh, Chris. Okay. All right. Go for it, Don. All right. Uh, sh share screen and share. Do you see that? Yes. Did that come up? Uh, yeah, we see it. Sorry. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I took this on uh, uh, April. Uh, 15th and uh, 17th from my backyard. It's uh, approximately Bortle 5. And um, I was using my uh, my 94 millimeter uh, uh, brand in Apo, which is F, F68. And um, this represents um, six hours and 48 minutes of hold time, three hours and 48 minutes with the UVIR cut filter. And then uh, three hours with the um, L enhance, 
And um, I did the processing in Ciro, GIMP, maybe a little bit in uh, Nebulosity. Uh, I also uh, uh, used uh, uh, Topaz uh, AI Denoise and one of the uh, tools in uh, sharpening tools in uh, in GIMP, which is a fairly new uh, uh, feature in the in it. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you, which was what I really liked about this was the uh, L enhance. It, it got uh, the red areas, the H alpha, the star forming regions. It uh, it turned out pretty well and. I didn't crop it because I I, uh, I like the uh, some of the surrounding galaxies uh, in the image and that and um, let's see yeah this is at six this is what taken with the uh, ASI two nine four Pro at six hundred and forty millimeters and well, that's me... good to know. that's pretty much the same as my color setup. Mm -hmm. And um, I have another image here. Uh, let's see. This um, took a little earlier uh, when I was up at the gun club. Um, this is uh, two galaxies, NGC 4536 and 4527. Don? Yes. Don, uh, it's still on M101 right now. It is? Uh, yeah. Let me uh, I'll leave and do it again. <laughs> oh, okay. or unshare rather. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unshare. Yeah. Yeah. This is the only time I do this, so I'm still kind of a. I'm looking across at the top. There's a new share. Is that the? Uh... <laughs> I do that. Yeah. I'll I'll, go, I'll try that. Yeah. I bet you that'll work. And. Uh... Yeah, this this should do it. Very good, very beautiful. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, yeah, this is uh, forty five thirty six and forty five uh, twenty seven, and um, yeah, it's interesting. You're talking about uh, not uh, keeping the uh, sky uh, too black. I I could have uh, I should have darkened it a little bit. It's um, um, and yeah, there's a sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. This. The other thing I noticed too is sometimes uh, the the refractor I'm using is like 34 years old. It was pretty much state of the art 34 years ago, but and it's very very sharp. You can push that thing to over 300 power. You can do some stupid powers with it, but um, it does um, show some uh, some halos and and this was uh, uh, defringed or the purple a uh, violet was removed. And that, and I think some of that is the uh, the uh, the telescope, and some of it is prop maybe focus as well. But uh, because on some images it's it's a, it's a you know a lot less than that. But uh, um, this is uh, three hours of data, and all the exposures on on galaxies are. I'm, I've been taking three min, three minute sub exposures with you know a, a, a Bortle five seems to work uh, pretty well, in that, and um, yeah, and I thought I had one more. I I, I switched over. Mike Mantini uh, got me interested in uh, switching to uh, the a, a, a to an ASI. Air um, Plus, and uh, to get away from my computer, the cables, and table, and chair, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and PhD two, and some other things, and uh, I I really love it. I mean, it makes setup a lot easier. Um, in fact, the uh, iPad I have has a lot better screen than the uh, than the uh, portable I have, and it's really nice because I can now. Uh, I can run the telescope in the house, or I get really cold. I can get in the car. It's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's worked out really well. And that, and let's see. I thought I had a picture of that. Uh, let me uh, let me try. Uh, uh, let's see. Hmm. Yeah. 
And uh, can you see this image or do I have to go with a new share again? New share. Yeah. Okay. You see it now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This this refractor I bought in the uh, 1988, 1989, and um, it's uh, really it's a, a uh, it's a shortened unif unitron uh, tube on it, and a unitron focuser with a uh, a cemented uh, uh, triplet. Uh, that is a uh, Christian Ricci, Ricci uh, design, kind of a prototype to some of the uh, uh, astrophysics. And I've kind of adapted, the, it has the original cradle on it and I've adapted uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ASI era plus. And a, uh, I, I went to a smaller guide scope because it's more rigid, it's uh, it mounts really well. The ca the camera, um, it's uh, attached to it. Uh, it doesn't move in that, and it also keeps down on the weight because uh, the serious uh, EQ I'm using uh, has some weight restrictions in that. But I'm I'm really pleased so far. It's not worth doing with this scope uh, an auto uh, a, a electronic autofocuser. Um, it would be really impractical, and I don't want to kind of mess with it anymore. In that, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's that's what I have. All right, beautiful. And uh, okay, okay. Anybody else uh, have anything they would like to share? Our virtual folks. No. Okay. Uh, are we ready over here for everybody in person? Yes, no, maybe. So are we up and running? Maybe. I hate Zoom all the time. Okay, very good. Uh, and well, now back to our regular schedule program. Okay, Naveen. Oh, wait a minute. There he, there he is. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is the best of the Bodes and Scar Galaxy I've gotten. I was thinking actually before that I wouldn't be able to capture them in one frame because this is uh, completely not cropped. So um, I'm like right at the limit. Um, but after, uh, I don't know, after maybe a couple months of messing around, I got um, everything steady enough and, and good enough, then, you know, rotated the camera the right way to have the maximum width I could. And um, 
with fixing some of my processing issues I was dealing with, I got it to look about like this. Um, I think cigar is still like a little blown out. I would have liked that to have a little more detail. I'm not sure if the colors are quite right either, but um, but this is the best I've gotten of those two. And uh, I'm pretty happy with them at this point. Uh, yep, that's... Uh, <laughs> yeah some of my pictures have the bloated stars um and some of them i've been able to um i think i was able to get it with the deconvolution um in serial there's a lot of tools for that that you can uh, kind of average out the stars and kind of pretty seriously cut back on the bloat um so yeah but basically if if you don't use something like Starnet to separate them out and process them separately, um, they kind of dominate the whole thing. That's hard to get a good balance um, with your galaxies or nebula. Um, some of the nebula ones in particular, like with the amount of exposure I got, I got like completely almost solid stars from top to bottom, you know? So if you don't do anything to them separately, it's just too much. Um, so you can go to the next one. So this one I did um, this week. Um, yeah, the Crescent Nebula, and this was over two nights. Um, this one's pretty heavily cropped. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with that. Um, like each individual sub, you really can't even like barely make it out. So with, I guess this is probably... 10 hours, I think is what I ended up with. Um, mostly two minutes, some four minute, and some minute and a half. Um, yeah, but, um, and this one, I think you can see the stars are a little more bloated. I wasn't able to get them down as much. Um, but yeah, like uh, this one, both of these so far have been with the reducer, which um makes the field of view a lot nicer but um sometimes you get some vignetting or the stars are really like warped at the edges um, but this was all done with Cyril and photoshop and um, noise exterminator um, that's been kind of a a game changer for me because without that it just seemed like I always would have too much noise or too much kind of almost look like grain or something. And you can do some stuff to try to blur it out, but trying to like mask your target and then blur the background and then get it back in. It wasn't working for me. It was just ending up with like a hard line between the two. And sometimes you'd have just a weird, like the galaxy looks grainy, but the background looks smooth and, I was finally like, oh, okay, I guess I'll spend the $50 on noise exterminator. And and then once I did, it was like, oh, now this takes like two minutes instead of two hours. So, and go to the next one. Um, yeah, so this one I really like. Um, It's a NGC 6995. I don't know if it has a better, like, common name or anything. I couldn't find one. Yeah, I think it is. Yep. <laughs> yeah i can't capture the whole thing with this setup um but i was i was able to get this piece which i has enough detail that i really like it um i did have to to mess with this one quite a bit because i was having 
um it was kind of like where the vignetting was meeting the rest there was kind of a weird color blotchiness going on that i had to work on correcting um but besides that i um you know i'm really happy with the amount of kind of depth it has and color um yeah yeah usually usually the flats work really good at getting rid of the vignetting and any dust but occasionally i'll have something i don't know why just doesn't quite do it right um most of these are in my backyard i think only actually i don't think any of them tonight i did at like big woods or anything and no <laughs> uh north raleigh um and a it's pretty light polluted and like there's a often either my neighbor's porch light or like a street light that's kind of nearby but um uh, that's something like i've been really happy with cereal cereal able to do is um the background extraction uh you don't need to do too much to get it to work right and it really takes out so much of the noise pollution that i when i was just using deep sky stacker and like photoshop it was like impossible to get rid of that and cereal seems to really pick it up really well and just remove it and it's made a lot of thoughts of like needing to do mono imaging or uh you know like an l extreme filter or something kind of go away because uh yeah no filter at all Um, so this, um, so this is question mark after I've gotten, so I ended up only using one night, night of data, but this was, uh, kind of the best I could do. And I, I guess what I was working on most for this one was color balance because like Cyril has the photogrammic color correction that usually works pretty good, but for some targets, like this one, it would just make it really yellow and kind of washed out. And I really wasn't very happy with it. So I uh, I brought it into Photoshop and I found, this is probably the wrong way to do color balancing, but I actually found that if you change, if you crop your levels, you know how you usually have a dead space at the beginning and the end of your, of your levels, you crop them slightly differently for each color with the RGB. And that can actually, it weirdly does kind of a better color balance than a lot of the dedicated tools. If you, if you crop each of those channels separately, just about to where the data starts, it usually gets pretty close to something like this. And then you can tweak it a little for each channel. And um, with uh, just increasing the saturation and vibrance after that, um, you can get pretty good amount of color and detail. I think that's probably the best I'm going to get without adding any sort of uh, filter to get more specific wavelengths or anything like that. <laughs> well, this is my first try. This is after like a year of different setups. <laughs> Finally getting a good setup that's close and has like, you know, a lot of resolution and figuring out the processing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I might have one more. I'm not. Yeah, so uh, this was Sunflower from two different nights. Uh, I think this one I got a little more than 12 hours of data for it. Um, and so this is uh, without the reducer, this is full, like 2000 focal length. And, and then this is actually, I think, cropped down from there because even then it was still a little small. It looks a little worse on the screen than it does in person. I don't, or, uh, you know, I think it's Zoom or something. Um, but yeah, I was pretty happy with this one, actually, the way I had it like a, a month ago when I first took the, the images. 
Um, but then just this week from learning some stuff with the color balance and the noise exterminator and some other stuff in serial with the stars, you know, this one you can see still does have really bloated stars. I didn't go as crazy with trying to correct those out. Um, but um, yeah, like, uh, you can even start to see little bits of blue and red and stuff in there. Whereas what I had a month ago was was yellow, and then you had kind of a really gray background that was hard to get rid of. Um, so yeah, um, still not willing to pay for Pix Insight or learn it. I did do the trial, and I found it just. He started the the, the creator of it started doing like tutorials, and like the first like five were like how to use the interface. So you know, I was like, this is not for me um <laughs> yeah this is uh don um uh, i i what would make a big difference on this if you just uh, uh ran a uh, through uh topaz uh ai denoise and 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 do a uh sharpening and denoise and i bet you it would really pull out a lot of the um, a lot more detail you'd probably be really surprised um um, yeah, I'll try something like that. Um, so I didn't do any sharpening on this, and I didn't do too heavy with the denoise. So there might be. Um, you could try something like a Richardson Lucy uh, sharpening. Something like that would probably work very well. Yeah, I think that's the last one I have, though. All right. So. Yeah, I removed Mars. Um, so I got the third panel in March. Um, so this is that that same one. It looks purple on the, the projector, but it's not. Um, I have to spend too much time. So this one is a four panel mosaic. Both of these were with the 135 millimeter Rokinon and T2i. This is a four panel mosaic two by two of Barnard's loop. That was my goal. Um, and of course, there's other bits and bobs in there as well. Um, let's see. I, this one's in PixInsight. The, well, they're both, both of these mosaics were in PixInsight. I try to do PixInsight if I can. Um, I've used the Microsoft Ice for solar and for uh, Milky Way stuff. So Navina is your uh, goal uh, with the Pleiades one there to eventually reach uh, California? It's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it like up and to the left somewhere, uh, I think? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I think I mean I will revisit this again um, and and see what I can get. I I ran out of uh, time with the comet taking up like a month or something of, <laughs> of all my imaging time. Um, that one processing time, yeah, it was brutal. Uh, let's see here. Speaking of Pleiades, uh, this is a two-panel mosaic. I got at a weird angle because of the comet. So I was waiting for it to rise uh, above the tree one night, or actually two nights. And I, I was playing around with different exposure times and whatnot. So I ended up with five hours with the Newtonian. I go to sleep. What are you talking about? <laughs> I get the camera rotated, and I'm like, I'm out. Um, this is why I went to Big Woods on Monday and Tuesday of last week and slept in my car. Uh, the Ro Ophiuchi Cloud Complex. I got almost two and a half hours on two panels. Uh, so left and right. And um, yeah, because my house blocks the view, this uh, low Southern target. Um, so I would get maybe 50 minutes in a night, plus Big Woods is darker than my backyard. So, there we go. Hmm? By a little bit, yeah. Yeah, well, 
this would have been south into Raleigh, but uh, yeah. Anywho. Yeah, what else do I have? Oh, right, Starburst Galaxy. Uh, this is with the Newtonian, about eight hours, HA, RGB. Um, I don't know what, what it is about this. I don't particularly like it, I think, but I'm done with it. Um, something about the colors, but I think that's it. Yep. Okay, well, I guess that sums it up. Um, anybody else have anything they've come upon just out of the blue while we've been talking that they'd like to present? Yeah, I guess we could, well, I guess we can turn the lights on or do it later. Yeah, so I mean, the, yeah, the whole point of people coming here in person, if they had something to present uh, as far as uh, their, or if they had some images to present, uh, we encourage them to bring their cameras and uh, their, uh, uh, the optics that they used. For me, for example, I brought my cell phone for the meteor crater. And uh, I didn't say this, but uh, the little close-up of the little astronaut in the middle of the crater, that was with a, uh, a Canon DSLR and a 200 millimeter uh, lens, uh, which I actually do use for astrophotography um, as well. Well, both of them actually. <laughs> so anyways, but, oh, uh, actually, uh, yeah, Mike Keith's right here. He can show us some too. Okay, so Anna, you might have to make me a presenter because I didn't put them on the. Uh, I sh there should only be one. I think so. Okay. So um, all of these are done, uh, were done at the Staunton River Star Party, and these are all EAA. So it's just, it's a typically 20 to 30 second um, exposures uh, doing live stacking for about five to seven minutes. So um, each of them is going to be a little bit different. So uh, we got the horse head here. Um, this one was hard to really kind of tease out a little more detail. For some reason, I've gotten brighter versions of this before. Um, so I don't know if I just needed to pump up the gain or not, but, um, again, um, I just, I, I love catching the horse head. It's it never, never gets old. Um, next one, again, this is just a, a staple, always got to pull, uh, one of, um, M42. Um, I went with, I tried to do a kind of a little bit more, um, adjusting in the gain, um, and I'd, I'd never really been able to get this um, kind of arc over here uh, to, to show, but uh, it's there. And just to note, I was mentioning this to Chris earlier, I'm using a very aggressive uh, focal reducer on my C11. Uh, it's a Optech uh, 0.33. Unfortunately, the working image circle is about 11 millimeters and my um, sensor is uh, almost 16 millimeters. So. I've got a ton of <laughs> vignetting uh, on there, just waiting for uh, Starzona to start making their Night Owl point uh, fours again. Um, this was uh, a, uh, what do you call it, um, M51. Um, and I had forgotten to put dark subtraction on, so you guys, there's a whole bunch of, of, of hot pixels in here. So, um, yep. Um, and well, the, uh, on screen really gives it this little kind of purplish hue. Um, but, uh, this one, I can't remember the name as one of the objects I was going after while, um, doing my Messier, uh, so not Messier, my Herschel 400. And I just love it when you're, you're looking at something and you get these little background galaxies, uh, and, uh, you know, it just, it's, it's. I don't know. To me, it's just amazing. You got a galaxy just kind of hanging out in the background, um, hundreds of millions of light years away. And then um, 
again, I, I guess I can't see the titles. I, I titled these, but this one I thought was really, really cool. Um, I just never seen it before. Um, I thought it turned out really nicely. Um, again, hard to see on the uh, on the screen or the projector, but you know, I was able to pick up some uh, some dust lanes. Um, and quite Im impressive and you can actually kind of see you've got uh, some of these other uh, background galaxies just kind of popping out here and there and let's see bear with me i think that's oh and then the last one um i think these are the twins yep um so i hadn't i hadn't picked uh, gotten them before but um, was, yeah, so I just thought it was really neat. I mean, you know, it's, again, it's EAA, so there's, I've done no processing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can, yeah, you can see it a little better there. So, yeah, I was, I was really, imp I, I, you know, I knew it was there, but, um, no, yeah, so. And I think that's, yep, that's it of mine. All right. Okay, uh, very good. Um, well, uh, I thank you everybody for coming uh, here in person. Uh, we have, well, we have plenty of food left over, so feel free uh, to take some home with you. I guess we can figure out some way of, um, um, taking some of this stuff home. Uh, also, I really, really like to thank all the officers here and the AV crew. This helped me out a lot because I had no idea how we were going to do this in person and uh, make it into a hybrid meeting altogether. So thank you guys. Um, also, uh, so uh, the way we wanted to work this, we decided on this like more probably about two years ago or maybe. Um, we wanted to uh, do this like every quarter. So uh, we we're thinking about doing this for every uh, uh, um, target challenge. And um, so uh, we don't have uh, a, a target challenge uh, a topic just yet. Um, so I guess we can like shoot some ideas off here right now. I mean, does anybody have an idea of something else that we should try to image a common theme? Anybody? the Sagittarius and um, uh, the, the whole kind of the summer uh, cluster, or not clusters, but all the summer items up in Scorpio and Sagittarius and... So basically the Milky Way core. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, I guess we could do that. So... Um, or if anyone else has ideas. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Right, yeah, I was like, yep, we're doing that. Yeah, one person decided for everybody, yes, is dad. Yeah, this is not a democracy, no club here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anybody else? Any objections or? Before, so, well, see, that's the thing. Uh, we're in spring now. So um, um, when we do the target challenge, uh, that was one of the things I had to get used to um, as far as like scheduling these objects that we wanted to image is that uh, we have to look at objects that are going to be accessible from today all the way to july which is i mean did i get that right uh may june july. yeah so july will be the where we present our re uh, results okay so yeah sagittarius uh yeah it's you're gonna have to stay up pretty you know early in the morning to get a, even a glimpse of it right now but you know by about may into uh, june it should start to become prime time for it so um i mean uh Again, we're open to any other suggestions. I mean, do you do you have anything else in mind? Yeah, I mean, that's the hard. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm um, yeah, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out with all these target challenges if we're going to do something that uh, requires us looking at an object during some time of the year. Um, yeah, you have to schedule it just right so that uh, it's uh, available more or less you know, after the, the next uh, uh, previous target challenge all the way up to the end. So uh, but anyway, okay, uh, Milky Way core, uh, anybody else have any other ideas? 
when you do that, Naveen, it looks like you're uh, thinking very hard. I mean, <laughs> so, trying to remember, I sent something in an email a while back, and I think it was like favorite object, but like reprocessing. And I, I come up with these ideas because it's kind of selfish. I've got a lot of data on different rigs for the Iris Nebula. And I was thinking about slamming them all, all together <laughs> into one stack and that being a challenge for me, but um, not, not a specific object. So. The imaging target challenge, target, object, target, good processing. I don't know. <laughs> 